So what I want to talk with you today about is it's a business problem and a technical problem. And I want to kind of walk you through a little bit of um, almost a little thought process or a little bit of uh, what I have learned uh, over the last year or so. So this here is a stool. And I'm using this analogy to describe um, how this problem is structured. And the problem is this, when you sit down with chip designers and you say, what is your biggest, most important, your most hairy problem, you hear a lot of different things. Uh, what we normally hear, I work at Arteris and we're an uh, interconnect IP company. So uh, we make the, the interconnect, which connects your CPUs and your graphics to your memory and to your peripherals. And so when we're talking to chip designers, they say, oh, Low power, big issue. I uh, got a problem there. I have tons and tons of IPs, which cause huge issues for me. You know, my chips before used to be 50 IPs. Now it's 100 IPs or 150 IP blocks. And once I make this darn thing, I can't debug it. And then you say, oh, okay. Uh, geez, you know, that sounds like a lot of problems. But they say, no, 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 I'm not done yet. My biggest problem is the schedules. I'm always late. And if we're late, we lose money. We lose sales. So this is the anecdotal evidence that, uh, that I hear from our customers. And what's interesting was back in March, got the EE Times results. And what they said in this survey is this was to uh, engineering manager, engineers and managers in the embedded space. And the, they say, hey, think about next year. What's your biggest technology challenges? And what was interesting to me is low power, debug, more IPs were all on this list. What was really interesting to me was hitting schedules was number one. Uh, most of the silicon nowadays is in consumer electronics, mobile phones, digital TVs, set-top boxes, all of those kinds of things. And guess what? Time to market, very, very important. What was concerning to me is when I say, gee, you know, I'm interconnect IP company and I look at buses and interconnects, I'm kind of down there in the bottom. That's, that's strange. What, what's going on here? Well, the answer is that, you know, within the industry, there's, there's an interconnect disconnect. Uh, buses and interconnects perceived as being, okay, that's a small issue. We figure out a way to get it done. But it's a big part of solving all these different problems that we just discussed. You know, as far as hitting schedules, uh, being able to uh, do multiple turns, multiple um, iterations of that interconnect, uh, or do more in less time, saves you time and money and reduces the, re reduces the schedule risk. Low power is very, very important. And there's new technologies like um, network on chip based interconnect IP that have a significant impact on not only your power performance um, within the, you know, the number of gates and wires that you have, but also in how you architect for clock gating and power gating uh, your capabilities within your SOC for that architecture. Debug, which is a huge issue that nobody thinks about until the end of the project, uh, having the observability within the whole SOC and not just within the CPU cores of the SOC to figure out what is going on when you're actually running real software on it. And then, of course, getting all of those IPs into the system. How many times when you develop a chip, you go you know, all the way through to when, hey, you know, we're going to tape out. Oh, but we need to make one more change in this IP. Or, you, or what happens when you're developing a chip. Most of our customers actually develop a platform where they have one mother chip and then a whole bunch of children chip based on that one chip. Again, being able to change an IP very quickly and get that RTL through verification is very, very important. So when I look at this, I say, wow. You know, the perception of within SOC development of what the interconnect is is 3%. And the reality is about 50%. That is how much time and effort people should be thinking about an interconnect. So what, what's changed? Why, why do people? in the past, you know, not think so much about the interconnect. Well, if you look on the left here, you know, this was a chip maybe five years ago. 
And what you see is basically a, a generally fixed function chip, uh, not a ton of IP blocks, not a ton of complexity, not a ton of software, uh, doing a particular function. And if you look on the right, uh, this is an example of a TI uh, OMAP 5430. This chip here has tons and tons of blocks of IP, over 100 blocks of IP. Uh, and when you look at the interconnect on that thing, uh, you have huge, huge expressways. You have small little roadways and side streets. You still have some village traffic here and there, but it's very, very complicated. So um, our company, our terrace, you know, in, in tackling this problem of interconnects, we say, gee, you know, this is a really big problem in the SOC industry. Um, and we actually have evidence to prove that it's a big problem that needs to be addressed and that is being addressed. And if you look on this chart here, this is just to give you an idea of the growth. And I'm just using this as a, um, as a way of showing some facts about how the interconnect is, is um, becoming more and more important. So this shows you know, customer growth. Right now we're at 42 customers as of the end of last quarter. And we've had 100 design starts. And you can see the growth. Now the growth is an indication of people having more and more pain on the interconnect and having to find a different way to do it. And that's why they've gone with a network on chip based technology and that's why they've gone with our terrace. And on the right side of the slide, you can see some examples of the publicly disclosed customers uh, that we have. And uh, there's quite a few big ones there uh, that we work uh, with. Uh, Samsung, Qualcomm, and TI in the application processor space. So if you're using a, a phone with an OMAP processor or some of the future Exynos or Snapdragon processors, um, we're in there helping solve these problems. And just to give you another idea, the, the area where um, interconnects are the biggest problem today are in the really, lo really large chips uh, within the application processor space. The reason is because of that, uh, that stool that I showed up front there. Huge time to market issues for schedules, of course. They have to be low power, tons of blocks of IP. Um, so the ones that uh, you see here, we're basically in um, most of them right now uh, for network on chip technology. Um, now this isn't just the, the limit of the purposes of you know, these SOC problems where they crop up. Uh, if you look at uh, digital TV, set top box, uh, those areas there, a lot of the automotive infotainment, these are complex SOCs, lots of blocks of IP, uh, and similar issues as the application processors. And again, the, the interconnect becomes the gate for performance and schedule and power um, in those designs. So what, what, what is this network on chip thing? What's, what's different about it? Well, there, there's a few different things here. And in this chart, what I'm trying to show is that, you know, the first thing that you'll notice is, wow, you see ARM and SIVA and Tensilica and MIPS. Now, if you were to take those different blocks of IP with the different transaction protocols that they use, and try to use a traditional crossbar or switch setup, you'd have a lot of problems. You'd have a lot of bridging. You'd have a lot of extra logic to handle the things. In a network on chip technology, if you look at the dark, um, if you look at the dark boxes on the outside of this interconnect box in the center there, those are called network interface units. And what they do is they take that transaction protocol and then uh, through our technology, turned it into a transport protocol, which is uh, what that allows us to do is to be agnostic for any protocol that any block of IP uses. Another thing that you'll notice is when you take a larger chip with a significant number of blocks of IP and have a crossbar and a bunch of crossbars tied together and bridged together, and then try to stretch that within the white space of your chip, what you'll find is that there are just too many wires and too much logic to fit within most of the white space of your chip. So what people end up doing is spreading out uh, the blocks on their chip, going, going back to look at that floor plan again late in the cycle, and then having to increase the size of their chip. Or more commonly what they do is they just cut features, cut off blocks of IP so they can then fit more, um, more interconnect within the nooks and crannies. With network on chip technology, you don't have to do that. Uh, because these are small elements of so using fewer wires than in a crossbar, you're much more easily able to distribute these elements throughout the real floor plan of your, of your physical chip. And with that, you don't have the routing congestion issues, you don't have the same timing closure issues that you have with a crossbar. Um, in addition to that, 
it's really easy to integrate uh, quality of service. So unlike in the crossbar world, where you kind of have quality service as an afterthought at the end, right in front of your memory controller, you can look at your arbitration throughout the whole interconnect to make sure that to meet the, the use cases that you have, that you get the absolute um, best right answer uh, by the time you uh, access scarce resources like your memory. Now one of the things, this is a, you know, it's pretty sophisticated technology, and one of the important things is to make it easy for people and to fit into their, their uh, design flow. So um, if you look at this design flow from top to bottom here, uh, we start off with kind of architecting what you need. You can think of it as, uh, you know, I call it the knee bone connected to thigh bone. What initiators and targets are connected? What kind of uh, protocols are they using? What are your clock and, and uh, frequency domains? What's your memory map look like? putting in all these different uh, parameters, and then uh, based on your requirements, looking at your topology that you need to do to meet your requirements. And then once all this is done and you've created your, your network on chip interconnect, you press a button. And once you hit that magic button, what comes out is the RTL for your interconnect, three levels of system C models for your interconnect, uh, OVM, UVM, and VMM test bench for your interconnect. And so you're all set to start hooking in your verification IP, checking to see if it works. You're also all set to take those system C models and put them into something like uh, um, Synopsys Platform Architect and do more detailed performance analysis and tuning. Um, but the point is, is even though it sounds like it's really sophisticated and hard to set up a network on chip uh, interconnect, uh, it actually isn't. And to give you an example of this, um, on the top line you see a, a, a a flow for a chip. The arrows going back and forth show iterations. You see the circular arrow, arrows there. And what happens is um, you end up parallelizing in most chips with the uh, verification and the uh, physical design aspects of the chip. And then at the end, it's taped out and debug. Now, one of our customers, and this person was doing a more graphics oriented chip, pretty sophisticated. Um, you'll see it in a, um, a lot of different uh, high-end uh, video projectors. What they were able to do is if you look at the interconnect design between the D and the V, they were able to really, really shorten that. They were, they were able to take and do in one to two days what used to take them months to do. What that allowed them to do was actually do a couple of things. One, they were able to get through the rest of the design flow process faster. They were also able to do a whole bunch of um, uh, FPGA emulation and software development in addition to what they normally do because of all the resources and time they freed up by using a network on chip based interconnect. So what used to be a 12 month process went down to a 5 month process. And if you can cut your design cycle that much, that's money in the bank. Now here's some examples of uh, some of the experiences our customers have. This isn't for one particular design, this is for individual designs. Uh, for a whole bunch of our customers, but uh, you know, cutting um, verification of the, their interconnect on five working days, um, doing twice the number of iterations of the interconnect within the same amount of time to get to the best, the best configuration, being able to, to accept ECOs and changes very late in the cycle, uh, cutting down the whole application processor. Remember, our, 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 some of our big users are Texas Instruments, uh, um, Samsung, and Qualcomm. And one of these customers was able to take what was an 18-month process and squeeze it into a 12-month process. Um, doing a, um, a LCD five months versus 12 months, and being able to do derivatives. I mentioned this before, but um, as there's you know there's fewer and fewer new out-of-the-box chip designs, what you're seeing is more and more platform-based designs, where there'll be one initial design coming from a design team, and then there'll be you know two, three, or four. Uh, children designs, sometimes by that design team, sometimes done by teams halfway across the world. Uh, being able to cut that cycle to create those children designs down to two months. So with the network on chip technology that our Terrace has, um, the bottom line on this slide, I know it's a little busy, but just want to show you some facts that show that you know when it comes to uh, wire routing congestion, gate count, performance, just about any parameter that you look at we beat the old way of doing things. Crossbars, tiered buses, um, hier hierarchical uh, designs using um, more and more crossbars. Uh, so 
what you'll see down below is the customer adoption of how this has changed over time. So it's becoming, it is standard right now. If you're doing a, a fairly sophisticated chip, you're using a network on chip based uh, interconnect. And uh, right now you're definitely using our terrace. So just to go into a little bit more detail, um, I talked about you know, squeezing the physical aspects of switches and how you fit that within the white space of a chip. But uh, in addition, within those switches, the, one of the reasons why that is so, so big is because you're doing all of the logic within that chip, or I'm sorry, within that switch. Uh, the, the width conversion, all the arbitration, your protocol conversions, all that stuff is within that big switch. Whereas in a network on chip, because you're doing it at the, those edges again, you are able to have um, a much easier place in route. And the bottom line is the architecture of a network on chip is much more efficient than what you find on a traditional crossbar. And to just show this graphically, uh, the colors indicate um, congestion in here. And what you're seeing is a before and after picture. Uh, the one on the left is a crossbar, the one on the right is the Arteris knock. And uh, uh, what you're seeing is that the Arteris knock, because it's fewer wires, uh, less logic, less ports to, or fewer ports to deal with. What you end up having is a, a much cleaner design that's much easier to go um, to physical place and route. So to make this happen, the interconnect basically touches everything within your chip, and I mean everything. So as a company, we work with a, a lot of people. Uh, Synopsys and Arm are uh, two very important companies that offer IP as well as tools that are important in this. TSMC is, is a fab. Um, Samsung, of course, being important, is Cadence. Uh, the point is, is that to create a network on chip interconnect, you have to work with basically everybody in the, um, if you look at it from a horizontal standpoint, the chip ingredient flow, and from a vertical standpoint, the chip design flow. And so for our particular company, just to fill you in on us, um, the reason why our terrace has been able to create a, a network on chip interconnect, whereas other people haven't been able to commercialize it, is because our, our founders came from kind of a different mindset. They're, from, they're initially from a network, uh, network processor company. So a mix of networking experts, software experts, and semiconductor experts. So uh, we were founded in 2003, uh, first customer three years later. Uh, the current FlexNock product that you saw with the, with the screenshots of all the GUI and, and all the uh, integrated uh, uh, verification and simulation tools, that was created in 2009. And so what you've got here is this huge investment in this infrastructure uh, to enable network on chip uh, interconnect technology. Uh, and one of the great things is, you know, at the end of this year, we'll have a, a couple hundred million units of chips uh, by our customers out in the marketplace. And uh, one of the interesting things that you'll see in our investors is some of those investors are actually uh, customers themselves, uh, Qualcomm and uh, Texas Instruments. And uh, other big uh, investors are people who we partner with very closely, uh, Synopsys and Arm. And it's not just our customers saying that, hey, this is the right technology to use for SOCs to get them to market quicker and, and meet schedules. Um, this year we were finalists for the E times ACE award. We, we won. Um, the Red Herring Global 100 Award. So that's one of 100 companies worldwide uh, for our technology. MIT Technology Review has recognized us for our innovation. And uh, even um, uh, the World Economic Forum has recognized us for the innovation. So I just want to remind you here that you know, the point today was to just say, hey, you know, when you're designing your chip, you have these problems. If you know, low power, more IPs, debug, and ultimately schedules, and it's important to really look at the root cause of what is causing those problems. A uh, couple of things I didn't discuss around network on chip technology uh, that I can say for a discussion later is the advantages and benefits as far as performance as well as SOC cost. Uh, 